So, um, hi everybody. Um, thank you for having me. My name is Natida and I am um, a postdoc in Sanowski lab and also working jointly with the neuroscience group at the Army Research Lab. Um, before presenting my work, I would like to first spend a few minutes talking about the importance of mentorship in supporting diversity in science. Specifically, I will be talking about my background and how the mentorship I have received throughout um, college and grad school has shaped my scientific identity. So I was born and raised in a small town in Thailand where formal science education was a privilege. In fact, um, I learned most of, of um, my pre-high school math and science from outreach programs run by various groups of college students, both from Thailand and from the States. Doing science experiments at school was out of questions. And so without a college degree, my parents decided to um, decided that the, the three of us um, should try to start a small science lab at home. So with help from a big pile of, of used textbooks, my parents and I together learn about um, plant reproductive system, photosynthesis, refraction, and more. And when I was 14, we came across this textbook called Fundamental Neuroscience by Dr. Larry Squire and others. It was nothing like anything we had read before. First off, it was all written in English and it had a lot of cool pictures of the brain. Curious to learn more, I would um, spend the next couple of, of, of months in search for some neuroscience books that were written in the language I understand, Thai. But I had no luck. Um, that was when I decided I wanted to go to the States and study neuroscience. But first, I needed English. So I did take some English lessons in high school and apply to colleges in the States. My first year at Middlebury College in Vermont was incredibly difficult. I had a hard time understanding um, the lectures and I had to pull an all-nighter just to finish a reading assignment. This made me question if, if I could make it through college, let alone going to grad school. I took several neuroscience classes with Professor Arndt and Professor Root. Um, and I cannot count the number, of, the number of hours they both spent during office hours to re-explain to me the, the most basic concepts I had missed in class. And throughout college, it was Professor Arndt and Professor Root who reminded me day in and day out that I could do it, that I could one day go to grad school and contribute to the field. Um, at a liberal art college like Middlebury, research experience is um, a rare opportunity. And during my sophomore year, I emailed um, over 50 labs asking if I could volunteer over the summer. Having zero research experience, I was surprised to receive um, the kindest um, response from Dr. John Serenis' lab at UC UCSD. John and, and everyone in the lab were extremely understanding and kind, and they went above and beyond to explain complex concepts and, and, and data analysis in, sim in simple language to make sure I felt included in all lab meetings. John also gave me an opportunity to co-present my um, to co-present a poster at my very first neuroscience conference, and with um, John's advice and guidance that extended um, years after my internship ended, I joined a neuroscience graduate program at UCSD um, three years later. So at UCSD, I was co-advised by John and also Larry, the author of my very first neuroscience textbook. And throughout grad school, I was also fortunate enough to receive mentorship from many other amazing mentors through graduate fellowship and collaborations. I am also grateful for each and every one of my lab mates who were also very kind, um, patient, and supportive. And together, these experiences have, have shaped my thinking and my scientific identity. So, I hope I have convinced you that if it wasn't for the guidance and support from my mentors, I probably wouldn't even think grad school was, was a possibility for me, given my background. And whether you're a grad student, um, a postdoc, or a faculty, there are things you can do to contribute to this, uh, these mentoring efforts. And you can start small. So mentoring can range from spending the, the extra five to 10 minutes re-explaining certain concepts to a first year student in, um, at a lab meeting to uh, a bigger effort like mentoring students through a summer research program. 
And when possible, please consider investing in students that don't have research experience. And um, there are now a number of programs that have been set up to help you do this. For example, the Summer Training Academy for Research Success or STARS program at UCSD, um, or the Colors of the Brain that is run, run by the Kavli Institute of Brain. So having been at both ends of this, um, I can tell you that it is an, um, absolutely rewarding. And these mentoring programs could have a long lasting impact on um, um, student mentees. Okay, so now I would like to present my work, that the, my current project that I have been working on with Robert Kim and Terry Zanowski, titled Probabilistic Information Processing in Humans and Recurrent Neural Networks. So um, naturalistic sensory environments are inherently probabilistic and certain stimuli are subsequently encountered more frequently than others. So to, to optimize um, this sensory processing, the brain needs to extract the statistics of, of the environment to form expectation against which incoming sensory signals are compared. And this expectation can be used to then um, fine tune the, and adapt the behavioral responses as the animals encounter novel environments. So while certain aspects of probabilistic information processing have been investigated through human psychophysics, neuroimaging and lesion studies, the circuit mechanisms that underlie this complex cognitive function is not well understood. And so, so to investigate the circuitry that underlies this process, we examine how humans and recurrent neural network or RNN model um, process and utilize um, probabilistic information to make decisions. So first, we tested um, human participants on a perceptual decision-making task where basically the stimulus probability was manipulated on a block-to-block -block basis, such that within each block of trials, one target feature, say um, horizontal orientation in this case, was more likely to be the target than the other feature, which is the vertical orientation. Uh, sorry, sorry the, the opposite. So the um, vertical target being more likely to be the target. So each of these blocks um, was treated as a training block, and we then tested participants' knowledge of the trained um, probability by varying the stimulus statistics of the following block to be either identical or different from the trained probability. So first, we have expected testing condition where, the two, where two adjacent blocks share the, like, share the likely target stimulus, for example here. Um, the horizontal bars being presented as targets more frequently in two adjacent blocks. So what you had learned during training can be applied directly during testing. In our task, experimental blocks were the target where the um, where the target orientation was counterbalanced, so 50% each, were also interleaved throughout the experiment and were used as a neutral testing condition, as shown here. And finally, we also have our unexpected testing condition where two adjacent blocks did not share the likely target stimulus. Finally, we also um, manipulated the strength of the sensory information um, presented on the screen through the frequency at which each of the, of the red and blue bars were being rendered on the screen. So in this study, we consider two strength values, so low flicker frequency at 33 hertz and high flicker frequency at 50 hertz. So this manipulation of the, the flicker frequency allowed us to investigate the probabilistic information processing under different levels of sensory strength. So whether the environment was noisy or, or less noisy. So then um, next, um, we can um, train our RNN, um, our recurrent network model on a similar task. But first, as a, as a background, recurrent neural network models have recently been used to investigate various components of neural mechanism or neural computations, such as perceptual inference and working memory. And because RNN models allow an, an experimenter to manipulate many aspects of the sensory environment and learning processes, including the network architecture, the task and the, uh, the stimulus set. So these models offer a complementary approach to in vivo methods. So here we use a, as shown here, a continuous variable um, firing rate um, RNN model consisted of um, n rate units, recurrent, recurrent, 
recurrently connected to one another. So in order to model more realistic and probabilistic sensory environments, we developed a simple training paradigm that resembled the one used in human studies. So in this paradigm, um, one input stimulus out of six possible stimuli was more prevalent and was presented to our model more often than the rest of the stimuli during training. So as shown here, you can see that um, the first stimulus um, represented in green here um, is, is, is um, expected or presented more frequently. And um, more specifically, this expected stimulus was presented in 80% of the training trials, while the other five unexpected stimuli were equally represented, so 4% um, of the time. And um, out of an honest trial, one of the six possible stimuli was presented for 125 milliseconds, and the stimulus signals were modeled as white noise signals with a constant offset value added during the stimulus window, as highlighted here in pink. So the offset value was varied to, to model the, the, the coherence or the, which is basically our proxy for the strength of sensory information. It's a little bit tricky to see here, but in, in um, the green line, you can see that the, the offset was added for the green um, um, stimulus. And um, the, and in total, we trained 30 um, models of 200 units, where 80% of the units were excit excitatory and 20% were inhibitory units to perform this task. And using this paradigm, we trained a continuous rate uh, model to produce an output signal approaching plus one as shown here when the expected stimulus was shown and zero when an unexpected stimulus was, was um, presented. And the testing conditions were set up in the same manner as in the um, human experiments, so where we had um, identical structure for the testing environment and different structure for the, for the testing environment. So we had expected, neutral, and unexpected. And, um, the, right, and the stimulus probability of each of the six stimuli um, um, is illustrated here. So now on to the results. We will first look at the human performance. Here we are plotting accuracy from each of the testing conditions and at each sensory strength um, condition. So for human, we found that accuracy was higher in the expected context and in the neutral and unexpected context in both low and high flicker frequency condition. And accuracy was also higher on trials where um, from high compared to um, low sensory strength. Um, being presented. Now let's look at our um, recurrent network performance. We're going to be looking at their, um, at their performance in the same way as our human data. And we observed a similar task performance trend in our um, recurrent network model. And overall, our model findings are closely aligned with the results from the human behavioral data. So um, now, although the exact circuit mechanisms underlying probabilistic information processing are not known, a recent experimental study revealed, the probabilistic revealed that the probabilistic learning could um, lead to a group of neurons in the mouse primary visual cortex to respond more robustly to expected or likely stimuli. So in, this, in our study, that would be stimulus one, right? So in order to investigate if such um, subgroup of neurons also exist, also exist in our recurrent neural network model. We first classify all the neurons in each trained RNN model based on their firing patterns in response to six stimuli. So for example, if a neuron fired more often when stimulus one, which is the expected stimulus, was, ex was presented, then that neuron was would be assigned to the stimulus one cluster. So using this method, we identify six subgroups of neurons in each recurrent network model. And for each subgroup, we then characterize its connectivity patterns to the rest of the subgroups, right? And so here we are gonna be plotting the strength of the pairwise inhibitory and excitatory signals between neuron, neuron subgroups selected for each of the six stimuli represented by, for example, I1 to I6 or E1 to E6. And right, so for, 
and and then we are we will be looking at also the low and the the high sensory strength condition but here we're just gonna start with the low sensory strength first. So in this condition, the neuron subgroup corresponding to the expected stimulus or stimulus one, shown to the left here, display a weaker weak within group inhibition than across group inhibition. And um, in addition, the subgroup selective for this expected stimulus, shown on the left of the plot here, also exhibited a stronger within group excitation than across group excitation. And here, I'm just um, summarizing the connectivity results um, in, one, in one plot. And next, we can look at the high um, sensory strength condition. Um, the, we found that our models exhibited similar network connectivity patterns as observed in the other uh, in the low, coherent, um, low sensory strength condition. Therefore, training our recurrent network model using a biased set of stimuli led to emergence of a, of a subgroup of neurons that were more likely to, to stimulate themselves and inhibit other neurons, resulting in enhanced neural responses at baseline. So to summarize, we found that both humans and the recurrent neural network um, model successfully extract information about stimulus probability and integrate this knowledge into their decisions and task strategy in a new environment. Specifically, performance of both humans and the recurrent ne neural network model varied with the degree to which the stimulus probability of the new environment matched the formed expectation. So in both humans and, and the models, this expectation effect was more prominent when the strength of sensory evidence was low. And these findings um, suggest that both humans and recurrent neural network model place more emphasis on prior expectation when the available sensory information was limited or noisy. Finally, by dissecting the train or um, recurrent network model, we demonstrate that uh, we demonstrate how um, competitive inhibition and recurrent excitation formed the basis for neurocircuitry optimized to perform probabilistic information processing. And um, by analyzing both human and model data, the, the, uh, our present study proposes an exper experimental, experimentally testable neural circuit mechanism important for decision making. And um, elucidating circuit mechanism required for this complex decision making um, could um, help better our understanding of, 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 the, of how such mechanisms are interrupted in, in um, neural disorders. And with that, um, I would like to end my presentation. Thank you um, for your attention and let me know if you have any questions.